Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Charts with Dan. We have a lot to get to this week. We're going to talk about the performance, or perhaps lack thereof, of West Side Story this weekend. We're also going to discuss the potential performance of what is bound to be the biggest movie of 2021, Spider-Man No Way Home, which arrives in theaters in four short days. So much to get into. But before we do that, I first want to thank the presenting sponsor of today's show, Carbon Health. I'm very happy to be partnered with them. They are working to get reliable and accessible health healthcare out there. You can find more information about them down in the description below. And I also want to thank the sponsor of today's show, Raycon. You can also find out more about them later. But don't forget that if you want to knock out that last minute gift shopping, you can head over to buyraycon.com slash Merle. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-M dot com slash Merle, M-U-R-R-E-L-L, for 15% off your entire order. And please stay tuned for more info later in the show. Let's jump right into the weekend box office, and the big headline from the weekend was the performance of Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. It debuted much lower than many expectations with just over $10.5 million. It was really just barely able to stave off the third week of Disney's Encanto, which was second with $9.9 million. And as a matter of fact, the entire top five had really strong holds. They were all between 41 and 23% drop-offs from last week, so we're seeing that long longer-legged box office that we've been seeing for several months now. In Kanto, as I mentioned at number two, Ghostbusters Afterlife in its fourth week remains in third place at $7.1 million, House of Gucci in fourth place at $4.1 million, and the previous MCU film, which I'm guessing is going to make way for the newest MCU film, Eternals, in its sixth week comes in fifth place at $3.1 million. But the big story is West Side Story because a lot of people were shocked by the performance of this film and a lot of different theories as to why it came in even lower than pandemic expectations. Many people thinking that the Steven Spielberg name might bring in a lot more folks. Many people thinking that the brand, the West Side Story brand, would bring in a lot more folks. I was somewhat surprised uh, at the low performance of the film, but as I dove into the demographics a little bit and saw who turned out for the film, then it actually became less surprising, but maybe not in the way that some people think, because as I mentioned, everybody has lots of different theories, lots of different narratives as to why this movie didn't perform well. One of the very few that I've actually seen is the reality that West Side Story was an adaptation of a 64-year-old musical, a movie that won Best Picture 60 years ago with a 74-year-old director, and yes, as great as Steven Spielberg may be, you cannot change his age, and with no bankable A-list stars in the lead roles. For any movie, that would pose some challenges. Add on top of that the fact that this is a musical, and uh, so many great movies this year have been musicals that it's actually easy to forget that musicals are not the biggest openers traditionally. As a matter of fact, I pulled the numbers for the top five opening musicals that were not remakes of Disney animated films because I don't think that's really what you're banking on there. I don't think you're banking on the musical aspect. I think you're just selling Aladdin or Beauty and the Beast or whatever. So these are the top five non-remake or Disney remake films. The highest opening live action musical of all time is from Disney. It's High School Musical Senior Year, which opened to $42 million, but did not not crack $100 million at the domestic box office. It had a big drop off. Then you have to go to Mamma Mia. Here we go again at number two with $34.9 million. Then Enchanted at $34.4. Into the Woods at $31 million. And The Muppets at $29.2 million. So four of these five still from Disney, though they aren't remakes of Disney films. So they had that Disney brand behind them, which may have boosted them at the box office. Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again at $34 million. The highest opening musical without a brand name or Disney attached to it. And I think in my enthusiasm for West Side Story, and it's a movie that I loved, it's one of my favorite movies of the year, I forgot how much of a challenge it is oftentimes for live action musicals to open at the domestic box office. They are tough sells. Oftentimes, they do have long legs, and I think that we are going to see West Side Story make up some ground over the holiday because it is the kind of movie that people might say, well, I'm not going to go see it this weekend. Maybe I'm out Christmas shopping or whatever, but you know what? We're going to take the family, and we're going to go later in the holiday season, and I'm going to be watching its gross as we go on throughout uh, the, the, the rest of December. This is often a time where we see see movies like Aquaman or like The Greatest Showman that have good openings or maybe even not so good openings in the case of The Greatest Showman and yet are able to accumulate grosses 
over the holiday season and sometimes even into January. That's something to watch for West Side Story. More than a lot of other films, uh, especially in other parts of the year, the whole story is not written in this opening weekend. Another thing that I think is very important to look at are the demographics of this film. Who showed up to the movie and who was the movie marketed to? I mentioned this is an older musical. It is going to skew to a heavily older crowd. And we saw that in the results of who went to the movies to see West Side Story this past weekend. What I did was I compiled the demographics for the top five opening films, so the movies that drew in a mass crowd, your Venoms and your MCU films, F9, etc., versus what we got for West Side Story, and they paint a starkly different picture. So looking at this chart here, the numbers in blue are the demographics for the top five openers, the average numbers for all five of those films. The numbers in orange are the demographics for West Side Story. So as you can see, 60.8% of the audience for the top five openers on average were male, compared to 43% for West Side Story. The flip side, 39.2% of the audience for the top five openers were female versus 57%, so well over half for West Side Story. These are very key graphics. 50.4% of the audience for the top five openers of the year were under 25 years old. Compare that to 26% of the audience for West Side Story, meaning 74% of the people who went to see West Side Story were over 25 years old. That's a very important thing to remember. When we look at the race demographics, 41.6% of audiences for the top five openers of the year were Caucasian versus 52% for West Side Story. So we see versus the top openers of the year an overperformance in the white demographic. Hispanic and Latino, 26.4 on average percent for the top five openers. A little bit of an overperformance there, not surprising considering uh, the, the plot uh, of the musical and the talent involved. 30% showing up for West Side Story. 15.8% on average African-American demographic, only 6% for West Side Story. And then when you look at uh, Asian and other uh, demographics, 16.2% uh, for the top five films, 12% for West Side Story. These demographics, by the way, are grouped and categorized by deadline. It's part of their demographic reports. That's where I got that information. I wish that I could have broken it down into more specific groups, but I can only go with the information that I'm able to find. So what do we see here uh, for who came out to see West Side Story? Heavily female audience and heavily over 25 audience. Why are those numbers specifically important? Well, back in August, The Hollywood Reporter published the results of a survey that were done by the National Research Group back in July of this year about consumer confidence returning to movie theaters. And look at the confidence numbers here. The highest numbers of confidence for people saying they're willing to go back to the cinema, males under 25, 88%. That's the group largely that was driving the performance of these big movies, the biggest openers of the year. But look at the group that said they were least willing to return to theaters. Females over 25 at 62% back in August said that they were not willing to return to cinemas. We've seen this also borne out, particularly in the specialty box office. Older audiences are slower to return to the movies. They feel like they're more at risk for COVID. They're not quite as willing to jump back into that theatrical environment as younger audiences. So females over 25 back in August, only 62% said they'd be willing to return. The second lowest group was males over 25. Only 71% said that they were going to go back. So over 25, the least likely back in August to say that they were going to return to theaters. And here you have a movie that obviously resonated the best with older moviegoers, particularly females, the least likely group to return to theaters. So if you ask me what happened with West Side Story, looking at the numbers, I would say that you have a film that did not particularly appeal to younger moviegoers because it was an older musical. And even though you have younger stars, they're not recognizable names with a younger audience necessarily. The biggest star for a younger audience was probably Ansel Elgort. That's about it. And you also have a movie that was appealing the most to the audience, which is least likely to return to the theater. That's what's behind the underperformance of West Side Story in its opening weekend. We'll see if these audiences turn up over the Christmas holiday. But there are so many other theories that I saw being thrown around, and it kind of ties into what I've seen with a lot of what's going on, not just in movie news, but in news in general, which is that when something like this happens, there's always an attempt to attach some kind of a narrative to it. And I saw several narratives that were attached to this. One theory that I saw was that white audiences particularly didn't want to go see movies about uh, Latinos and Latinas, which again, if you look at the demographics, the Caucasian
Caucasian demographic actually outperformed on West Side Story versus what we saw in the top five openers of the year. On the other side, usually of the ideological spectrum, you had the group saying, get woke, go broke about West Side Story, which is particularly hilarious because the plot of that musical hasn't changed in the last 60 years, but basically people saying that audiences rejected it because they didn't like it ideologically uh, on that side. And a lot of this is driven by social media, particularly Twitter. You see people all the time citing Twitter when they say, oh, well, the movie flopped because of this, and here's why, because this person said this on Twitter. But let's break down the numbers on Twitter because Twitter is far less representational of the average everyday American than most people would have you think. You see here the US population, these numbers were gleaned from the 2020 census. The number of people 15 plus, 15 is the age at which you're supposed to be able to have a Twitter account. Of course, we don't know how many people perhaps under 15 have them. We kind of have to go by the information that we can measure. 270,675,281 Americans over the age of 15. Of that number, 73 million users have Twitter accounts. That's 26.9% of the Twitter eligible audience. According to Twitter demographics, 37 million of those accounts are what they call daily active users. People that are on Twitter every single day that see ads that they can track. That's now 13.6% of the US population eligible to have a Twitter account. And then Twitter also says that 90% of the tweets that you see or the tweets that are sent out on Twitter come from the top 10% of users, which means that on average, 90% of what you see on Twitter is representational of 7.3 million users or 2.6% six percent of the Twitter age population. So what you can glean from the numbers is that the people that are active daily on Twitter and the people that are your super tweeters are in fact far outweighed by the people that are not active users on Twitter and particularly people that are not heavy Twitter users. And I think that the big part of this with Twitter and by extension other social media, including YouTube, including Instagram, etc., is that people go and they find things and they say, this tweet or this post or this video is representational of what the average everyday American feels. When as a matter of fact, you're not going to find what the average everyday American feels on most social media networks because most of them don't have the average everyday American on them. That doesn't mean that important things don't happen on social media. That doesn't mean that it doesn't play an important function, but it is not the voice of the common person. And so when you see something like West Side Story here and the fact that it's not doing well, I think a lot of people kind of bend over backwards using social media as a crutch to say, well, it's because of this ideological thing, which they probably have already established. It probably already lines up with their worldview. It's something called confirmation bias. When in fact, I think the thing that you can look at that's much easier to explain is that West Side Story was marketed to an audience that has been shown habitually and repeatedly to be the most reticent to return to movie theaters. The box office mutates at the best of times, depending on what year you're looking at, and that was without any of the pandemic stuff added in. So when you see stuff like these West Side Story numbers, I think it's important to look at history, look at demographics, look at what people do, compare it to other films. Don't just take the easy and quick explanation because those are rarely, in my opinion, the driving force behind why people didn't go see these movies. And that's not to say that there weren't people that skipped West Side Story because they don't like the people that it's about. And it doesn't mean that there aren't people that didn't go see West Side Story because they didn't think they'd like the politics. But it's not, in my opinion, the majority of people. I think it's a much more complex answer than that. But complex answers aren't sexy and they don't click. And I think a lot of times people want to go for the easier answer when in fact, it's much more boring to go into the actual numbers. So moving on from West Side Story, let's look at the other numbers for the past weekend. The top per theater average for the third week in a row was Licorice Pizza in four theaters, a $43,124 per theater average. It now has set the top three marks for per theater averages in 2021. Its first week with 86,000, its second week with 60,000, its third week with 43,000. And to put that in perspective uh, just a little bit, Avengers Endgame brought in $76,000 per screen when it opened back in 2019. That was the biggest box office opening of all time. If Spider-Man No Way Home opens to $200 million this upcoming weekend, which is something that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, that would be, on an average of 4,400 screens, an average of $45,000, which is pretty strong. So when you see here the numbers here for Licorice Pizza, the theaters, the four theaters that have been showing this film for the past three weeks have had the equivalent of three to four big MCU premiere weekends in a row for the last three weeks as far as the money that's coming into that theater. 
that's pretty good for business. And I think that they have Paul Thomas Anderson to thank uh, for his strategic rollout for the 70 millimeter, et cetera, on Licorice Pizza, because they've been doing MCU style business now for the past three weeks. Looking at the top five specialty films, these are movies that are in limited release, 1,000 theaters or fewer. Come On, Come On leads the pack in its fourth week in 569 theaters, but Licorice Pizza was right behind it. It's coming up on an expansion very soon, $172,000. In third place for the first weekend is a movie from A24 called Red Rocket. This is a movie from Sean Baker. He's done a couple of films that I'm a big fan of, including Tangerine and The Florida Project. It's about a former porn star who moves back home to small town this is one of those indies that i don't necessarily know if it's getting oscar buzz but you may see it pop up in things like the independent spirit awards etc and if you just want to see what, what seems to be kind of a small a sleeper film that's in third place with ninety six thousand dollars. in fourth place is a film from japan called drive my car with sixty thousand dollars and this is not a year that we had like with parasite where the best international film race is kind of locked in for one movie drive my car is a movie that has been picking up not just accolades for best international film but accolades for best picture best actress things like that in different critics groups so if you want to be keyed in to that oscar race and the other awards uh, for best international film or film from another country drive my car i think should be near the top of your list because i think this is a real contender to bring home the academy award potentially movies like Titan from france have kind of cooled off in the last few weeks and drive my car is one that i think could take home that Academy Award. And then in fifth place in its second week is Benedetta from director Paul Verhoeven and 123 theaters bringing in just over $50,000. Looking at the comparison of the box offices from 2019, 2020, and 2021, you'll see we took a huge dip in week 50, not even close to what we got back in 2019. And here we are, basically we have two box office weekends left in the year. And the mark to beat for week 51 is right around $250 million, which basically means that Spider-Man No Way Home has to hit the absolute stratosphere and get some help from the films below it in order for us to beat that mark next week. I'm not saying that it's not going to happen, but I think that is an extreme best case scenario. Looking outside the domestic marketplace, let's look at the top five international films. Schemes and Antiques is number one at $14.6 million. Encanto at number two with $13.6 million. House of Gucci in third place with $10.1 million. Be Somebody in fourth place, another film from China at $9.8 million. And Clifford the Big Red Dog, which is still opening in some markets uh, outside of of the United States and Canada in fifth place with $7.4 million. When you combine the domestic and the international market, you get the worldwide numbers. And Encanto is the number one movie once again in the world with $23.5 million. West Side Story under delivering, not just in the domestic marketplace, but also worldwide, not bringing in a lot of money uh, really from anywhere, $14.9 million. Schemes and Antiques at number three with $14.6 million. House of Gucci right behind with $14.2 million and Ghostbusters Afterlife in fifth place with $13.5 million. When we look at the 2021 domestic numbers, the number one movie for now is Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. I think it's going to be topped by another MCU film, but I think that also means that three of the top four movies for 2021 are going to be MCU films. Four of the top five are going to be Marvel films. Venom Let There Be Carnage at number two with $211 million. Black Widow at three with $183.6 million. F9 at number four with $173 million. Eternals comes into the top five with $161 million. No Time to Die at number six with $160 million. A Quiet Place Part 2 drops down two spots because of the continued performance from No Time to Die in Eternals. It's now number seven with just over $160 million. Free Guy is at number eight with $121 million, followed by Jungle Cruise. And Dune is knocked out of the 2021 top ten with Ghostbusters Afterlife jumping in. Uh, you could say that it's in danger of being knocked out by Spider-Man No Way Home if it makes more than $112 million in its opening weekend. Uh, but if Ghostbusters can pocket about $5 million more, dollars, it could knock out Jungle Cruise, and that could be the movie that exits the top 10 next week. We'll just have to see how that does. And looking at the 2021 Worldwide Box Office, no change as far as ranks go from last week. The Battle at Lake Shangjin is still number one, followed by Hai Mom from China. No Time 
Time to Die at number three at $771 million, F9 at number four, and Detective Chinatown 3 at number five, Venom Let There Be Carnage at six, Godzilla vs. Kong at seven, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings at number eight, Eternals at nine, and Dune at number 10. Before we continue, I want to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, Raycon. We are so very close to Christmas, and you probably have a few people left on your list that you haven't checked off. You've probably been inundated with gift guides and people telling you, well, why can you get all these people? Well, there's one place you can go that is a one-stop shop for everybody on your shopping list because it has the thing that all of your favorite loved ones and relatives, and let's be honest, even some of your not-so-favorite ones, are going to use every day, and that is Raycon. I've been using Raycon wireless earbuds for the last few weeks on the air and even off the air when I'm watching stuff on my computer or editing, and that's because they're the first wireless earbuds that I've found that actually fit comfortably into my ear and deliver the kind of sound quality that I need to do what I need to do. Raycon wireless earbuds give you amazing quality wherever you go, whether you're using them to pump up or wind down, to work or to work out. And they're going to be useful for anyone on your list. And even better for you, they start at half the price of other premium audio brands. With their latest model, you get three new sound profiles to make sure everything you're listening to sounds its best with just the amount of bass, pure mode, balanced mode, and bass mode. And Raycons are available in five stylish colors, so you can pick the perfect one for everyone on your list. And with free shipping and returns, gifting is easier than ever. The holidays are coming up faster than you think. Now is the time to knock out that gift list and avoid the last minute shopping scramble, especially because right now, my viewers and listeners will get 15% off site-wide with the code HOLIDAY at buyraycon.com slash Merle. Go to buyraycon, that's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash Merle, M-U-R-R-E-L-L, and use the code HOLIDAY today to get 15% off your entire Raycon order. That link, once again, buyraycon.com slash Merle, and I want to thank them for sponsoring today's show. So we are on the cusp of the most anticipated film of 2021, Spider-Man No Way Home. And the question that's been on everyone's lips is, how is it going to do? There have been some crazy estimates, anywhere from uh, over $100 million, which I think is an almost certainty, to some people saying over $200 million, which is, I think, a, a, a very high estimate. So let's look at some of the indicators. Let's look at what history tells us, even though history is not as instructive as it sometimes is due to the current circumstances and where I think Spider-Man No Way Home is going to fall in this upcoming weekend. So first, let's look historically at the kinds of movies that have opened at this time of year. And first, we're going to look at the top 2021 opening weekends just in general for this year. Venom Let There Be Carnage at number one, $90 million. Black Widow, $80 million at number two. Shang-Chi Legend of the Ten Rings at number three, $75 million. Eternals at number four, $71.2 million. And F9 at number five, $70 million million. I would be shocked if Spider-Man No Way Home was not the top film on this chart for next weekend. I would bet a, a substantial amount of money on it. I think that it is going to easily be an opening over $100 million. So I'm going to go ahead and lock in my prediction over $100 million. I know it's a very bold prediction, but we're kind of going incremental in steps here. Let's look at the top five openings for the month of December domestically. At number five is The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey at $84.6 million. By definition, by me saying that I think that Spider-Man No Way Home is going to top $100 million, I think it will take at least fifth place on this list. Rogue One, A Star Wars Story is at number four with $155 million, followed by Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker at number three, $177 million. Star Wars, The Last Jedi at number two, $220 million. And are you sensing a trend here? Star Wars, The Force Awakens at number one with $247 million. So... This is another question. Where do I think that it's going to fall on the December opening weekends? Well, we'll I'll come back to this one because I don't want to give away quite yet what my final prediction is going to be. But I will say I think The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey is going to be journeying out of this top five because I do think that Spider-Man is going to be joining these four Star Wars films as one of the five highest openings of December. Looking at the MCU in general, these are the top five opening weekends for Marvel films or films in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Avengers Endgame at number one with three 
357 million. Avengers Infinity War at number two with 257 million. 2012's The Avengers at 207 million. Then Black Panther at 202 million. And Avengers Age of Ultron with 191 million. So those that are predicting an opening at $200 million or above are putting Spider Man No Way Home in the top five for the MCU, uh, beating out Avengers Age of Ultron and putting it in the Black Panther Avengers range. So that is one place that we could be looking at uh, for this film. And then looking at the franchise in general, how Spider Man movies opened. And I think people might be surprised. They might have thought that Spider Man films, uh, more of them had opened over $100 million, but only three have. The highest domestic opening weekend for Spider Man film is still Spider Man 3 with $151.1 million, followed by Spider-Man Homecoming with $117 million, Spider-Man at number three, the original Spider-Man film at $114 million, Spider-Man Far From Home at $92.5 million, and The Amazing Spider-Man 2 at $91.6 million. But there is a big asterisk on this list, which is that Spider-Man Far From Home actually opened on a Tuesday to take advantage of the July 4th weekend. So it's Opening weekend was actually the fourth, fifth, and sixth days of its release. Through six days, it made $185 million. Its first three days, it made $92 million. And I think that if it had opened on that holiday Friday weekend, so after the July 4th holiday, I think it could very well have been the top opening film uh, in the Spider-Man franchise, have beaten out Spider-Man 3. It's just that it did not open uh, in that traditional Friday through Sunday window. And the way that we keep records is we count the first weekend as the first weekend that it's open. So I do think that Spider-Man Far From Home would have been much higher in this list had it actually opened on a Friday. So that leaves open the question, how much do I think that Spider-Man No Way Home is going to make and where will I put it in the record books? Well, as I've said, I think it's easily going to be the top opening of 2021. I think it is going to be one of the top openings of December. And I'll go ahead and say right now, my prediction for the Spider-Man No Way Home opening is not $200 million. Although if it did eclipse that number, I certainly would not be shocked. I'm going to predict it opening at about $180 million, which would put it just over the rise of Skywalker in the record books to be the third highest domestic opener of December, bumping Rise of Skywalker to four and Rogue One, A Star Wars Story to five. That would mean it does not become one of the top five opening Marvel films at $180 million. It would be shy of Avengers Age of Ultron, but it would be the highest opening Spider-Man film of all time, topping Spider-Man 3's $151 million. And why did I pick $180 million? Well, it's very tough. It's so difficult to judge a film like this because if these were the normal times, I think I would probably uh, be putting it over that $200 million mark. The big question mark being the pandemic. How many people are not going to go to the theater? How many people are going to stay home uh, because of the potential variants? Uh, just because they're not ready to go back to a theater yet. And to a certain extent, listen, I think that if Spider-Man No Way Home were screening exclusively in the eye of a hurricane on the planet Mars, that $100 million worth of people would find their way to see it. This is one of those four quadrant movies that a certain number of people are going to go see no matter what. It could be screening in the contagious viruses lab at the CDC and I think you'd still be packing people in because this is a heavily anticipated movie. This is also a movie that people are very spoiler phobic about. There is the anticipation that there are going to be things revealed in this movie that you want to experience that you don't want spoiled much like we had with Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame so I think that's going to drive a lot of business but I'm going to put it under that $200 million mark because I do think there is an X factor with the pandemic not that people aren't going to go see it, but that they may not rush out on opening weekend, that they might go Monday or Tuesday, maybe stay off social media, or they don't really care that much about spoilers to try to avoid the crowd. That's why I'm pegging my prediction at $180 million. But like I said, if it gets over $200 million, I'm not going to be shocked. It really is just how many people are not going to go for those first three days. I think it could come in under, uh, very possible that it could come in under, but I think this is the most bulletproof movie that we've seen come out post-pandemic because so many people are anxious to see it because the vaccine is available because a lot of people have gotten their boosters they feel safer and I think there's so many people that are going to make their first trip to the theater to see that so lock it in if it's anything like my summer movie predictions then it's probably not correct but my box office prediction for 
Spider-Man No Way Home. $180 million over three days. Of course, we'll be back here next week to break down all of that and to see how many people actually did show up. But an exciting weekend, I think, if you're a moviegoer. By the way, I will be going to see Spider-Man No Way Home tomorrow. There will be a review up early on Wednesday here on the channel. Don't worry non-spoiler review. I would, wouldn't would dream of spoiling the movie before it came out. Uh, and then we will probably do a spoiler review here on the channel this upcoming weekend once the movie hits theaters. So stay tuned. In just a couple days, you're going to get that Spider-Man No Way Home uh, review actually less than 48 hours from now. It's very exciting. I'm very excited to see the movie, and we'll see what happens. Before we end the show by looking at the streaming charts, I always like to look at a box office flashback. And this week we are going back 25 years, that makes me feel really old, to December 13th through 15th, 1996, which saw the debut of Jerry Maguire, one of those uh, long burn holiday hits, uh, garnered a lot of Oscar attention, uh, and one of my favorite Tom Cruise movies as well. Number two, opening that same weekend was Mars Attacks from Tim Burton with $9.3 million. Then a holdover at number three, 101 Dalmatians with Glenn Close. So we've been about 25 years between live action Cruella adaptations with $8.9 million. That was a Thanksgiving movie that held on throughout Christmas, much like Encanto is doing. The Preacher's Wife starring Denzel Washington and Whitney Houston opening in number four at $7.6 million. And in its second week, the Sylvester Stallone vehicle Daylight, Die Hard in a Tunnel, at $4.1 million. So before we wrap things up, let's look at what people are watching on the streaming services. And as always, we start with Amazon. Things are getting even Grinchy over there because The Grinch is now the number one most rented film on Amazon at number one, followed by Venom Let There Be Carnage, which is available for purchase, No Time to Die, which is available for purchase, Free Guy and Dangerous, which are available to rent, Dune, available premium video on demand, is at number six, Spider-Man Far From Home at number seven, so a lot of people catching up on the Spider-Verse. Belfast at number 8, available premium video on demand, F9 at number 9, and speaking of the Spider-Verse, entering the chart at number 10, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, A Rising Spider Floats All Boats, so two Spider-Man films in the Amazon Top 10, people just trying to scratch that spider itch uh, before Spider-Man No Way Home opens. Let's look what people are checking out over on iTunes. At number one is No Time to Die, available for purchase, followed by The Grinch, available for purchase or rental. The Hating Game is at number three, followed by Ron Howard's How the Grinch Stole Christmas at number four. The Last Duel, available for purchase at number five. Venom, Let There Be Carnage at number six. Dune, available for purchase or rental at number seven. Elf at number eight, another holiday entry and a new one onto the chart. Free Guy at number nine. And Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer stays on the chart at number 10 from last last week. And finally, we're wrapping up by seeing what people have been watching on Netflix. As we've talked about, these are the new global hours watch numbers. So this is actually a measure of last week's viewing numbers, the viewing numbers from November 29th to December 5th. And overall, the top 10 most watched programs on Netflix, part five of the series Money Heist, by far the number one watch thing on Netflix globally with 189,920,000 hours watched. The Queen of Flow season two drops one spot to number two. The third season of Lost in Space coming in third, followed by True Story at number four. The Power of the Dog, which is a big awards contender, enters the chart at number five with 27.2 million hours watched. Spoiled Brats comes onto the chart, the overall top 10 chart with 26.7 million dollars watched. A Castle for Christmas also opens the overall most watched chart with 25.5 hours watched. Red Notice still on the chart, though it does drop five spots to number eight. Selling Sunset Season 4 drops two spots, and rounding out the top 10 is Bruised, which drops five spots with 23.3 million hours watched. The top 10 most watched movies on Netflix globally, led by The Power of the Dog from director Jane Campion. She is uh, up for uh, potentially several Oscar nominations. Uh, Jesse Plemons also in the film, Kirsten Dunst, Benedict Cumberbatch, Cody Smith McPhee, all of them receiving Oscar buzz. Number one most watched movie globally, followed very closely by Spoiled Brats at number Number two, A Castle for Christmas at number three, Red Notice at number four, Bruised at number five, A Boy Called Christmas at number six, and then four new entries, Single All the Way at number seven, 14 Peaks, Nothing is Impossible at number eight, The Whole Truth at number nine, and Green Snake at number 10. 
And looking at the most watched series on Netflix, this is both in the English language and not in the English language. Money Heist Part 5, obviously, since it's the most watched program across all of Netflix, the number one most watched series, followed by The Queen of Flow Season 2, Lost in Space Season 3, True Story at number 4, Selling Sunset Season 4 at number 5, and then we have Hellbound still on the chart at number 6, Squid Game, 12 weeks on the chart, still there at number 7, Lost in Space, the first season at number eight. So some people catching up on the new season of Lost in Space. Some people catching up on the first season, I guess, because they want to binge and catch up with the whole show. Arcane season one at number nine. I am currently watching Arcane. It's part of a series of reviews I'm doing called The 12 Reviews of Christmas. That one is going to land right now, according to my schedule, on Christmas Day. So be sure to stay tuned for that. And then Elves season one enters the chart at number 10 with 17.9 million hours watched. And that wraps it up for charts today. A lot of numbers and facts and figures, and I'm excited to get into more next week because Spider-Man No Way Home, what will the opening be? Will it be close to my prediction? Will it be no way close to my prediction? We'll find out. Also, Nightmare Alley from Guillermo del Toro starts playing in theaters this upcoming week. One of my favorite movies of 2021. So if you can't get into No Way Home, that's one that I recommend. You can actually find a review of Nightmare Alley. It's also part of my 12 reviews of Christmas. It came out yesterday. You can click the little thing up in the corner to see that. A lot of business still to take care of as we close out the end of the year. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see even more of what I'm up to, you can check me out on Patreon at patreon.com slash Dan Merle. And don't forget that you can get everything that I do on YouTube on my podcast channel as well. If you prefer to listen that way, you can find all those links down in the description below, as well as more information about our presenting sponsor today, Carbon Health. I want to thank them once again for being a great partner as they team up here on Charts with Dan. Thank you so much. If you're heading out to see Spider-Man this weekend, stay safe. I hope you enjoy. Be sure to stay tuned right here this week because we're going to be covering that that opening from the review to the spoiler review to the box office over the next week. I'm super excited. I know a lot of other people are. Have a very safe Spider-Man week, and we'll see you next time. Bye. 